Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 227 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Well, I don't know about you, but my 2024 has had a bit of a rocky start, and I'm going to tell you about it because it's going to affect possibly my podcasting over the next couple months. So what happened was right after Christmas, I was told by my landlord that they wanted the house back, which means that all of a sudden I have to move, which means I'm pretty busy trying to think about how to get to a new place, what it's going to be like, and how I can move myself there, including the stuff I need to use for business. And that means my little sound booth that I'm podcasting in. So I'm telling you this because over the next couple of months, there might be a little bit of rockiness in that, I don't know, I might miss a podcast episode or I might sound like I'm in a tunnel if I have to podcast in a bigger space that hasn't been built up with my sound panels yet, or I might have to podcast in a blanket fort. I don't know. But <laughs> just to let you know, things might be a little bit rocky for the next couple of months. But I'm mentioning this to you not only because I might need a little bit more patience from you than I would normally, but also because it's making me think about what people did in the Middle Ages, where they put their stuff, because packing is very much on my mind right now. So I like to think about everyday objects when it comes to the medieval world, where people put their stuff, how they carried it around. So because this stuff is on my mind, today I'm going to be telling you a little bit about how people carried their stuff and where they put it. So it's going to be all about medieval carrying and packing coming up right after this. Before we get started, I just want to say at times like this, people sometimes want to reach out and be helpful. So I just want to say that I do know my legal rights and I've got things under control. It's just a little bit stressful right now. So if you want to be helpful to me, the best thing that you can do is just be patient. Keep telling people about my podcast so that I get more listeners and I get more people who are interested in the Middle Ages tuning in and just send your good vibrations. That's all I really need from you. So if you have the impulse to be helpful, as I know so many of you are so kind and helpful all the time, all I need from you is just some good vibes. That would be awesome. One time on the internet, I saw someone had taken a picture of a sign where the word lemons looked like the word demons, and they had captioned it as, when life gives you demons, make demonade. <laughs> and I don't know whose picture that was, and I wish I could cite it, but just put it this way, I am just making demonade out of the situation <laughs> right now. And one of the things I'd like to do for you at some point is before I take this little podcast booth down, I want to take a video of it and show you what it looks like in case you're somebody who also wants to do recordings at home and want to see what it looks like before I take it somewhere else and rebuild it, probably in a different way. And actually, this is one of the things I'm looking forward to most is redesigning. So I'm really doing okay. Send your good vibes. I'm going to try and take a picture or some pictures or some video of what this podcast booth looks like. So if that's something that you're interested in, just follow me on social media at 5MIN Medievalist. I'm doing most of my posting on Instagram, which is not a lot. But if you're going to follow me, Instagram is probably the best place to do it. Okay, let's get to the medieval part of the program because that is what you're here for. And it's really what I'm here for too. So let's get into the Middle Ages, what people carried around and how they did it. So when I was doing the medieval masterclass for creators, daily objects was the first class that I did for people because I think that it's really important to get in touch with a culture by looking at the things that they touched every day. People touched every day, carried on their bodies. So that's where I'm going to start today. Most of us today have pockets in our clothes. Famously, we often don't have pockets in dresses, which is something that, again, the internet is all over. So I don't need to tell you about this. But we carry a lot of stuff in our pockets, generally. And in the Middle Ages, people didn't tend to have pockets in their clothing. And I've thought about this a little bit, but I haven't really researched into it. My theory on why people didn't have pockets is not because they were too dumb to have invented pockets, but because there's always been a tradition of using folds in your clothing to create pockets or bags or things like that. You can see people doing this with tunics and togas into antiquity. And I think people were doing this in the Middle Ages as well. There are pictures in manuscripts sometimes that have people using a fold in their clothing to carry things around. So that was working perfectly well. Another reason I think that people weren't using pockets very much at this time was because they were using fabric that could sometimes stretch. So wool can stretch depending on how thickly it's made. 
And if it's wet, it definitely can stretch. And if you can only afford a few garments, you don't want them to get stretched out of shape because you've been carrying your keys in pockets. And I think another related reason might be that if you don't have a lot of clothing or you don't have the budget for a lot of clothing, you are reusing your clothing in different ways. For example, pregnant women would sometimes just let the seams out in the sides of their dresses and they would add panels to allow for the pregnancy and then they would take the panels back out after they had delivered their babies and their shape changed again. So if you're going to be reusing these clothes or recycling them or cutting them down to make children's clothes. It's also another reason you might not want to put pockets in them because it makes it more difficult to reuse these clothes. If you add a panel to a dress, all of a sudden the pocket is in the wrong spot. So I think all of these things are related, but I will say that I didn't research pockets very closely over the course of my education or the years since. So I'm sure somebody has thought about this more than I have, but those are my basic theories on why people are not using pockets that much. So people carry their stuff on the outside of their clothing. And if you're rich, this is a perfect way to display your wealth. So this could be another reason why you don't want to hide stuff in your pockets too. So everybody in the Middle Ages is wearing a belt or a girdle. And often if you didn't have a lot of money, you might invest in a belt that was a bit longer than you needed so that it could grow with you if you happen to expand or shrink with you. And girdles, what women were wearing, could sometimes be very valuable because they could be gifts that were given by a future husband, for example, to a bride. And so if you have read Chivalry and Courtesy and you want to flip to the back, there is information about girdles there. So if you want to look up more information about girdles, you can. So people are carrying stuff on their belts or their girdles. One of the things that they have to carry around is one of the things that we need to carry around quite a lot, which is our keys. And of course, you can put them on a ring and then attach them to your belt. And it's easy to get at them when you need to, although depending on how securely they're fastened, you might need to undo your belt, which isn't the most convenient. But it's helpful if you're trying to keep things like keys away from servants, because in sources like The Good Man at Paris, they talk about locking things up to keep the servants out of them. So if you're a chatelaine, for example, it's handy to have your keys securely tied to your waist. When the Viking exhibit came to the Royal Ontario Museum a few years ago, one of the interesting things that I saw was a needle case that had a loop on it so that it could also be carried on the body. Now, I don't know if this particular person was carrying it as a pendant or attaching it to their belt, but I thought it was cool that this needle case also had a ring on it. And there was a flint that had a ring on it as well. So these are things that people are carrying about even earlier than the period that I have spent the most time on. And in the later Middle Ages, sometimes you might find something called a girdle book, which would be something like a book of hours that instead of having a hard cover, had a soft leather cover that could be gathered up like a handkerchief and then attached to the belt so that women especially could carry, this is why they're called girdle books, women could carry their books around on their waists, on their girdles, so that they would always have access to these books of hours. They would be available for prayer whenever they needed them. And again, something like a book hanging from your belt is a very nice status symbol to let people know that you could afford a book and that you could read. And these are two things that you might want to advertise to the world. When people wanted to carry coins around, they would do it in sort of a drawstring bag a lot of the time because these are easy to make and they're easy to attach to something. But the problem with a drawstring bag is that it's very vulnerable to thieves. So sometimes you'll still see a thief called a cut purse. And that is because if a person is walking in a crowd, instead of picking their pockets, a cut purse would just grab that pouch that was attached to the belt and cut the strings that were attaching it to the belt. And so they could take off with that money. So if you've ever heard of a cut purse, this is where it comes from. People stealing a pouch of coins off someone's belt by cutting the strings. These pouches can be made of anything, really. All sorts of different fabrics. You could have expensive fabrics or cheap fabrics. You could have something like velvet that's really well embroidered or an old piece of wool or a piece of canvas. These purses could be made of just about anything. And some of the ones that have survived have survived because they are embroidered with metallic threads. So they've held together a little bit more. A lot of these containers that I'm talking about today will disintegrate over time, especially if they have been buried with someone because they're made of biodegradable objects. 
So sometimes it's hard to find the evidence or a widespread amount of evidence as to what these things look like. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes you want to depend on a manuscript image, although you always have to be careful with that in case it's meant to represent something other than the literal truth. So these little drawstring purses are something that people would be carrying around, usually attached to their belt. And if they wanted something with a bit more security or a bit more structure, people would have a purse that looked more like a saddle bag. So if you can picture that saddle bag shape to it with kind of two bumps at the bottom and sort of a flat top folded over and buckled, this is something that we see quite a lot in manuscripts that people carried their stuff in. And the advantage to that is that it's more securely attached to your belt. This is the kind of thing that might have two loops at the back, kind of like those cell phone holsters that people still have. Some people still have. I remember that was really a thing with Blackberries, although I don't see that as much anymore. So these are leather. They're a bit stiffer and they can have a buckle on them, which means no one's getting in to steal your coins the way they could if they were just cutting the purse right off. And often you will see people especially reenactors, will have a leather bag like this on their belt and they might have a dagger tucked in behind it. So everything is kind of together on the belt off to the side of the waist so it isn't really in the way of people's hand movements. These types of bags are kind of bulky. It's not the type of thing that you usually would see a woman wearing. They're usually the type of thing that you would see a man wearing in a manuscript. When it comes to bags, you can sometimes see people having sort of a satchel that might be made of cloth or leather in a manuscript, but I've never personally seen a leather backpack of the style that people have today. When we think of a backpack, I haven't seen anything like that personally. And this doesn't mean that it didn't exist. It just means that I haven't seen it. And I'm wondering if this could be because leather can be really expensive and it's not something easily made at home, a leather backpack. If you've ever tried to stitch through leather, it is a real pain to do. So a leather backpack would be something that you would be getting from a specialist, somebody who works with leather all the time and has the right equipment, the very sharp needles that could go through it. What I have seen instead is baskets. Baskets, when you think about it, are really, really easy to make. They're free to gather the stuff for. Usually you can make a basket out of small branches, young branches or reeds, and you can just go and gather those outside. So you don't have to pay a leather worker to make a basket. This is something that you could make at home if you've had some practice. So you do see a lot of manuscripts where people are carrying stuff in baskets, maybe on their hip, maybe over their arm, often on their heads. And sometimes you'll see people using a basket that looks kind of like a laundry hamper, very big, cylindrical, and that is carried on their backs. So I've seen manuscripts where people are carrying stuff like grapes in these sort of wicker backpacks. And I've also seen people carrying toddlers in wicker backpacks in these manuscripts. So I think those are more often used than something like the type of backpack that we would see today. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. One of them being that it's a lot cheaper to make those, use them, and discard them if they get worn out or covered in something that you can't clean or something like that. So baskets are something that people were using quite a lot. And this is something that if you look at the modern world, you see people in more rural areas using baskets all the time. So this is kind of intuitive and something that you'd see a lot, I think, if you traveled back to the Middle Ages. So that's pretty much how people carried stuff in the Middle Ages, baskets, maybe folds in their clothing, stuff hanging from their belts or girdles, little purses, little satchels. That's how people would be carrying their stuff around. And because it's on the outside of the clothing, sometimes you would be carrying stuff on the inside of your clothing, especially if you didn't want a cut purse to take it, but often it's on the outside of your clothing. It's going to be beautiful, as beautiful as you can make it. So not only fabric that is embroidered, like I mentioned, but leather that's colored, it can be dyed and embossed. It could be embroidered as well. Anything that is on the outside of the body is going to be something that people want to be beautiful. So when we picture the Middle Ages, it's not just brown leather satchels and things like that. It is also beautiful objects on the outside of your clothing, including dyed leather. When it comes to the interior of houses, 
most of the time people didn't have built-ins. So they didn't have a shelf that was already built into the wall. And there's a couple of reasons for this. The biggest one being that most of the walls are not really going to be conducive to that. So if you're rich and you're living in a stone castle, for example, it takes a lot of planning and really being sure about what you want to use the room for to build in stone shelves. So that's not something that you see a lot of, as in a bunch of built-in bookshelves in a castle. It's not something you usually see. And when it comes to people who are not living in castles, often they're building their houses out of wattle and daub. And even if they're living in the city, they might not use actual panels of wood for the interior walls. They might also be using wattle and daub inside their houses, even if they're not poor, because it's light, it's easy to make, and it insulates pretty well. It's also very hard to cut a thin board to use on your wall. So wattle and daub, so this means woven branches with a sort of clay-like texture added to the outside. This is how people are building the inside of their houses, which means that, again, it's not something that's going to be conducive to built-in furniture. This is all to say that most of the furniture that people are working with for storage is going to be sitting on the floor instead of built into the walls. So you might see in a manuscript people having something that looks like what we might call a buffet or a hutch now, but people mostly carry their stuff around in chests. When you think back to the past, it's really important to imagine because everything is made by hand and because it takes a lot of resources and time to build anything, most of these things are not being made out of cheap plastic or anything like that. They're made from wood. They are handmade, which means somebody has had to fell the tree and plane the wood and sand it and all of those things before it even gets cut into boards that can be used for something else. Because it's so labor intensive, you want it to have as many functions as possible. It's interesting to me now that people are working with tiny houses and how they can make all of this stuff that is in a tiny house versatile, because this is how humans have been living for thousands of years in tiny houses, and they want their furniture to be versatile. So this is one of the reasons why people are using things like chests, because not only are they storage, but they're seating as well, or they're tables or they can be stacked. There's a whole bunch of reasons to use wooden chests, which is why people have been using them for thousands of years. The other advantage to using a chest is that it's portable. So most people are not moving house as much as I am, <laughs> just through circumstance. But if you are royal, for example, or if you're high up in the nobility and you have a lot of land holdings, you are moving around quite a lot. So it's helpful to have a chest in which you can keep your stuff and have it move with you. If you're thinking about royals that moved a lot, King John is one of the best examples. He moves all the time. So you can imagine there's a lot of moving to be done and you want to have it in a chest that is easy to move. That said, wooden chests, if you've ever tried to move someone that has wood furniture like me, it is very heavy. So that's something to keep in mind if you decide to build a medieval house, I suppose. Chests also, of course, is very logical. They can be built in a huge range of sizes. I've seen ones that are the size of a hope chest or the size of a shoebox or even the size of a grand piano in the case of liturgical vestments, the outfits that priests are wearing. And I think it's at Salisbury Cathedral where they have the massive, massive chest for the liturgical vestments, which does look like the size of a grand piano. Most people are not going to have these in their houses. Obviously, that one is in a church. The ones that I have seen that have survived are usually smaller. But again, because they are out where people can see them, they are often decorated very beautifully. So they might be carved, they might be etched, people might be using wood burning to create a pattern in things, painted boxes, of course. And they will often have metal hinges. You can also have leather hinges, but metal hinges pretty often. And then some of them are even locking. So they could look like an old treasure chest, but most of the ones that I've seen have a flat top on them so that you can use them for seating if you need to or a surface like a table. People would be using these chests for things like seasonal clothing because you're not always going to be wearing the same clothes depending on the season 
or stuff that you need to reuse later that you might not use every day. But people are also putting stuff in these boxes like dishes, which you might use more regularly. If they don't have a cupboard, the stuff is going in a chest. Of course, not all of our objects are bulky. Some of them are small. And some of the most beautiful boxes that I have ever seen are for these small things like toiletries, combs, brushes, little medicines, papers, tiny books, ink and quills, all of these things will fit in a smaller box. And these boxes, because they are smaller, can be made out of other materials. And what I'm thinking of especially is ivory. There were a lot of boxes made out of ivory that were sold in the Middle Ages, and they are absolutely beautiful. You can find examples of these. I like the Met Cloisters collection because they really have good pictures that you can check out. But there's also some beautiful ivory boxes that you can find at the British Museum. And these boxes, my favorites, of course, can be very predictable, are the 14th century ivories that are carved with scenes from romances. So these are some of my favorite ivory carvings. And when you think about it, if you're going to have a beautiful box, what do you want to have on it? I wouldn't say this is the same thing as the fandoms that we have now, but it's sort of akin to it, where a lot of people will have some object in their house that is related to something like Star Wars or Marvel, or one of their other fandoms. And it's kind of like that in that you might have a box at home with a carving of Lancelot on it, if you like. There are many of these boxes, and a lot of them were carved in Paris, like I mentioned. If you go to a museum, you can see that they will put on a plaque next to the object, here is a box, it's made of ivory, and they will often specify that it's elephant ivory. So this is interesting to me for a couple of reasons. Number one, it shows that there was a trade of elephant ivory. That means that people in Europe are getting it from far away. The trade networks are alive and well, and they are able to bring vast quantities of ivory, in relative terms, to places like Paris. Now, I don't want to think too hard about what this means for the elephants, but the point is that there is a trade that is spanning continents, and I think that's really interesting. They also will sometimes mention that this is elephant ivory because it's relevant in that there are other ivories that things can be made out of. And I'm just throwing this out there because I think it's very interesting. People also made objects, although not usually boxes, out of walrus ivory, so walrus tusks. And then I've also seen objects that were made out of whale ivory. And I had to look this up because whales famously don't have tusks. So what is whale ivory? And it's actually made from the teeth of an orca. So sometimes, and I saw a chess piece made out of this, things can also be made out of whale ivory. So this is just an FYI in case you need a little bit of trivia to get you through your week. Elephant ivory is not the only ivory that people made stuff out of in the Middle Ages, but it is the most consistent ivory that people made boxes out of. So if you've never seen an ivory box, I would really encourage you to look these up at the Met or at the British Museum because they are just gorgeous. Ivory really allows for a lot of intricate carving. You can see absolutely beautiful boxes. So imagine you're living in the Middle Ages. What are you going to put your stuff in? You're going to put it in big, beautiful chests and small, beautiful chests. And all of them are going to be as elaborately painted or carved as you can afford, because these are the objects that are going to be decorating your home and that you're going to be interacting with every day. So as the final piece to this, as somebody who's thinking about moving, how do people move their objects from one place to another? Well, if you have a small object and you have a well-trained dog, which I don't, you can have stuff moved around on a dog cart. So dogs actually did pull carts sometimes in the Middle Ages. So you could put stuff on a dog cart if you were just moving it a short distance. People, of course, also used carts that were pulled by horses and by donkeys. And so These carts are pulled behind the animal. And then, of course, you can actually pack up your horse or pack up your donkey, not usually your dog, with things like baskets and bags and rolls of fabric if you have those. So this is how people are carrying it back and forth. It's pretty obvious. You might use something like a wheelbarrow, but you might also be using a cart that is pulled by an animal. There you go. Perhaps not the most profound episode in that we didn't get into a lot of natural philosophy or anything like that. 
But these everyday objects are things that I like to think about a lot because I think they're a really good window into another culture, especially that of the Middle Ages, which is my jam. So as you go through your life today, take a look at the things you're carrying around and think about how you are carrying them and how you might carry them in a culture that doesn't have pockets, for example, or how you would store your stuff if you didn't have the certain types of furniture that we have today. I always find these things to be a very interesting thought experiment, and I hope you've enjoyed this episode as a little window into how people are carrying and moving and storing their stuff. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, so I've been looking at advertising in the Middle Ages. It's kind of like a modern concept, but if you dig around, you can find examples of it in the medieval world. You know, some of the popular ones are like the signs outside of taverns in, say, London, or I love that in Paris, they would go with criers, town criers going out, hey, the drinks are on sale. What's the drinks and stuff like that. So <laughs> fun stuff like that. I love it. Of course, we also have the false advertising, people being a little deceptive, there's a few examples of that that have kind of popped in. The, the best one is Greenland and how the uh, person who discovered it in the 10th century named it as such because he figured that would attract more settlers. <laughs> it was a better name than Iceland. Yeah. Was yeah. that already taken anyway? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, can't name it Snowland or Iceland or let's just make it <laughs> Greenland. Perfect. So we've got that. Plus, James Turner is looking at the Scottish king, Alexander III. Mm, nice. Yeah. Well, thank you, Peter, for telling us all of the new and interesting stuff happening on Medievalist.net this week. Thanks. Thank you to everyone who supports my work and that of other indie historians through Medievalist.net's Patreon page. Patrons have access to all sorts of amazing goodies like subscriptions to Medieval World magazine, a book club, digital downloads, and ad-free versions of Medievalist.net and this podcast. And if you're a member of the book club, I hope you'll enjoy my book, How to Live Like a Monk, which will hopefully get you started off on the right foot this year, courtesy of Abbeville Press. If your New Year's resolution is to support your favorite podcaster through patronage, I hope you'll check out patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from carrying to parrying, follow medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of Chivalry and Courtesy, Medieval Manners for a Modern World, now out in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an awesome day. Mm-hmm.